A couple more things. We still want to cover the waiting list and the reminder. Let's go over the reminder first. You check this box if you want to be able to print a reminder for the patient, either on an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper or on a 4 by 6 card. Just make sure it's loaded into the printer before you click OK, because once you click OK and this box is checked, it's going to print off. So I'm going to uncheck it. Okay, next we want to cover the wait list here. And let's pretend that we have another patient that's going to schedule an appointment but can't get in to see Dr. Rice here on this day. So what we're going to do, and in order for the wait list to work, we still have to schedule a patient somewhere on the scheduler. And you can see up in the calendar here, let's say March 30th is the earliest we can see Carrie Heffernan. So I'm going to click clear here to clear the patient's information up above. Type in HE, first couple letters of the patient's last name, and hit the tab key. And there's Carrie Heffernan. She calls up and she says, do you have any time open today or this morning? And I go to the 29th, which is today, and let's say I have nothing. And she says, well, can you please call me as soon as possible if any time opens up this morning? I'll say, that's fine, but in the meantime, we can schedule you. And you have to schedule a patient on another day to add them to the wait list. So what we're saying here is we're saying, look, uh, we can't schedule you now, but maybe we can see you tomorrow because Dr. Rice is available tomorrow. So she says, fine. And we just left click on, let's say, 845 make the appointment, select what type of appointment it is, maybe a follow-up, so I can double-click here. And then down below, this is for Dr. Rice, is her doctor, even though she has a couple of other referring providers there. Let's say this isn't a referral, this is her main provider, Dr. Rice. And the thing about this is, is if you do add referring providers, they'll be listed here. And so at one time, she was referred by Dr. Lawrence, maybe a couple weeks ago, and Dr. Um, Abram was another referring provider. So they'll be bunched up with your main provider here, Dr. Rice. So want to make sure that you select uh, the default doctor if this wasn't a referral. And the default doctor for her, again, you can look up at the top, is right here, Dr. Rice. So I'm going to select the doctor here. Now before I click OK, you got the waitlist box. I'm going to check that. And I got three options. Does she just want to see any provider that's available? And I can select that. And so you can see I've got quite a few doctors, Smith and so on. Maybe she just wants to see Dr. Rice. So I'll select this provider. And of course you can choose Dr. Rice here. Or is it just a column? In other words, you can have column calendars that you can select from if that makes it easier. And remember, each column can be tied to a provider doesn't mean that Dr. Smith, because that's the name of the column, means that he's, it's tied to Dr. Smith. So we'll just say Dr. Rice, and we can say comments. Maybe that's more an emergency room incident, but in any case, we'll click OK. And then we'll click OK down here. And boom, it does two things. It schedules her for 8.45 tomorrow, in case if we can't get her in today, which is March 29th, up on the calendar. And it adds her to the wait list. So if I click on this button, it changes the top and it tells me who's available on the wait list and she's a medium priority and you can set the priorities when you're setting up your appointment types and that's in the training video of setting up your scheduler. So I can close out of here. I'm going to click on the button where it says go to today. I can either click on it to come to March 29th or just select March 29th here. Okay let's say that we do have some time that just opened up now and we want to go to our waiting list and you can have like two, three, ten, I mean as many people on the waiting list. All you need to do is click on the button. Select anybody in the waiting list that you want to schedule down here in the open time slots. So we'll select her here and then we'll click on the move button. Now the reason why we're clicking on move button, remember she's scheduled tomorrow to come in. So what we're actually doing is when we click on this, it's we're moving her appointment from tomorrow and putting it in today. So let me click on it. You can see right here it says we're in the process of moving. All you have to do is click on an open time slot and then we'll move it. Of course I can click cancel if I don't want to, but we're going to say 8.30 just opened up and left click. Tells me I'm creating an appointment in the past and that's okay. Usually all your appointments will be in the future and I'll click OK. Boom, there it goes. Does two things. It schedules her appointment here and if I go back to the 30th, she's no longer there. And in fact, what I do in its place is I get a wait list and we'll talk about when appointments are moved or canceled or deleted, um, basically a wait list will pull up. But what we're doing right now, just to keep things simple, is that we move the appointment from the wait list from a, a later date to today's date. Okay, now that we schedule the patients all their appointments here, you can check them in and check them out just simply by left clicking on your appointment. You can see I got quite a few options. We just did the first one, edit the appointment. We'll collect a copay in just a minute, but first let me show you what it's like to check in a patient. So if I go ahead and left click here, it'll tell me if I don't have a patient consent memo on file. Now this is something I set up. 
In other words, if I don't scan in a patient's consent memo and in the patient demographics say that we have it on file, it's going to keep reminding me to get this from the patient. So I'm going to click OK. All it does is it puts a little tiny asterisk there, if you can see just to the left of Heffernan's name. All it says is that we check the patient in. So this could be helpful. So if the doctor's in the back with his tablet PC or on his computer, and he has the scheduler up, and he clicks refresh every minute or two, um, this will update and show him that, oh, Carrie's now uh, um, in the waiting room. And then the front office, when they take Carrie back into one of the rooms to sit to wait for the doctor, they can then left-click and select Other. Then it changed from an asterisk to an exclamation point. So when the doctor is in the back and he clicks his refresh button, he's like, oh, well, there's an exclamation mark next to Carrie. She's in one of the rooms. Um, let me go to the room and, you know, treat her. And then finally, when this is done and the doctor's finished, the patient goes to the front office. The front office can then left-click and check the patient out. And all it does is it changed that little symbol to a pound sign. So we know that any time we see a pound sign next to any of these names here, then we know that the patient's done for the day they're, they're checked out. Now, this doesn't affect the billing. It's just a visual cue for the front office and the doctor to know where the patient's at in the office. And you'll notice that when I select certain options and I left-click again, I'm limited to now what I can do, including collecting a copay. Let's say I made the mistake of checking the patient out, or let's say checking the patient in for that matter, and I want to undo this. What I can do is, well, first click off, and click on the Check In button. You can't do it by left-clicking here. You have to go to the Check In button. And you'll see a list of all the patients for today's date, March 29th, and all those who are checked in. All I have to do is uncheck the Check In and click OK and it removes it from all the check boxes, other and out. You can also check them in here if you wanted to, you know, by checking the boxes there. And if they don't have a consent memo on file, it lets you know. And it stamps the time, but I'm not going to do that, so I'm going to uncheck it. Close out. Now, the symbol is still there because I need to refresh, so click on the refresh button to update your calendar. And now it's gone. So then I can left-click on her name again and get all the options. So we know how to check a patient in. If you collect a copay, it does two things. First, it posts the money of $15 if that was a copay, and it also adds an asterisk like they're checked in because obviously if you're getting money from a patient, then they're there and you're checking them in. So let's go ahead and collect their copay. First of all, up at the top you have the payment code, PP for patient payment. If you forget what the PP is for, then click on the ellipsis button here, and there you go, or payment patient. So I'll click cancel. Now, the payment amount. You see the static box where you can't change it at all? That's what's pulling from the Patient Demographics Insurance tab. So what that means is that if you enter in the copay on their insurance tab, $15, it will show here. And then it assumes that that's how much they're paying, which usually it's correct because they don't want to pay any more than that. However, if they want to pay more, and they can, and the cool thing about this is, is they don't have to pay just the amount of their copay. You can post the front office, and this will save the biller on the back end tons of time if they can collect the money up at the front. So, for example, let's say their copay here, like it says, is $10. I can say, well, they're paying $10 plus, they're paying an additional $90 from a previous appointment that they want to catch up on their payments. So we're going to type in $100 and hit the tab key. Um, you know, if they're paying by check, Visa, MasterCard, whatever, we'll do check, and then we can type in their check number. What we can do down here, which is really fun, is that in the notes field, we can type in, so the biller knows what's going on, $10 is their copay, and the $90 is for, and maybe a different data service, or, or just say it's for a data service. So what's going to happen is if we click OK now, this isn't going to print out on the receipt unless we check the box receipt, in which case the patient's going to get a receipt, which is really nice. But it's going to be in the patient's history tab, so when the biller is looking at the payments that are collected, they can go, oh, $10 is for the copay, and I need to put allocate $90 over for another data service. So this helps it break it down for the biller. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And basically, you're getting a warning here. In other words, it's telling us, look, the amount payment that you put in of $100 doesn't match what the default is of $10. And you can do one of two things. You can either click OK to update the primary insurance coverage. In other words, if you click OK, it's going to post the money. In fact, if you click OK or cancel, it's going to post the money either way. It's just that if you click OK, it's going to change the $10 in the default insurance to $100. It wants to give you that option just in case you want to update the default copay amount without having to go in the other screen and update it yourself. But remember, <laughs> the copay, we still want it to be $10. So the other option is, is to click Cancel to actually post the $100, but don't update the $10 copay. That will still be the default. 
So I'm going to click Cancel. And you'll see not only do you collect the copay, of course, but now we've checked the patient in as well. So it does double duty for us. So when I left click on that appointment type, I no longer have collect copay. So since we're here, let's say that the patient's checked out. I'll go ahead and select that. Next, let's go to another appointment type so we can finish up our training here. Let me left click on Max here. So we have the click copay, check in, check out. Now what if they're a cancel or no show? Well, if I go ahead and click cancel here, it's going to pull up some reasons and also if I select no show it pulls up the same reason list and it just says, well, why did they cancel or why are they a no show? And you can select the one, of course, maybe they forgot. And then it removes them from the scheduler here. Normally, there would be a little waitlist hold here because I set up my system defaults to say, look, if I cancel or delete a no-show, then I want to be able to have in its place a waiting list, a hold type. Just like you see down here, new patients, it would say waitlist, prompting me that if a time does open up, to go to my waitlist and to schedule for my waitlist. But again, this is done in the past, so it's not going to happen. I'm scheduling all my appointments in the past for the purpose of this training video, because otherwise, there are certain things I couldn't do if I scheduled in the future that I'm showing you now. Let's move on and left click on John Adams here. So we've done everything here. Cancel, no show, it's the same thing. If we need to select the payment, let's say that um, Adams calls up and he says, well, I got a new phone number. We well, can select, select patient here. And then up at the top, it pulls his name. In fact, he doesn't have a home phone number. He wants to give it to us. So all we have to do is click on the edit button. It'll pull up John Adams in the patient demographics. Or I could go ahead and type in his phone number and then be sure to save my work when I'm done. And then close out. And then back in here, it's not going to show up unless I click my refresh button. And it clears his name, so I could left click on Adams again and select patient. And then there's his phone number. Left click on his name again. Um, you can look at his appointment history. You can either do it here or you can click on the appointments button, but we'll select history here. And you can see for his history, this includes past, present, and future appointments. Right now, all we have is the time when the appointment was made, by who, and the time. And you can do an audit log, which would generate a report for you if you need to print it off. Otherwise, we'll close out here.